Deja vu, huh? We're back with more Resident Evil, but instead of looking at the remake this time, we're heading all the way back to the 1998 original. Though as before, Resident Evil 2 would also see its fair share of re-releases. It got a DualShock version shortly after, adding feedback support. It saw a Nintendo 64 release, if you could believe it. And this was quite the feat to pull off at the time. N64 cars didn't have much in memory, but Capcom not only managed to fit both gameplay scenarios with little to no compromise, but they also squeezed in almost all the full motion videos as well. And those were always notoriously large in file size. It was only missing the EX battle mode of the DualShock edition would later include, but hey, gotta give it to them, N64 players were getting some Resident Evil love. And from what I understand, this version is perfectly fine, minus some slight audio compression. Then of course they got a PC release, they got a Dreamcast release because that was just making the Rhinostorm this time, gotta make that launch window strong, and eventually the game would also be ported to the Nintendo GameCube. There was also a version released for the Game.com? And I was offered a means to look at it for this video, but I looked it up and... No. I think I'll pass on this. Sometimes you know what you're getting into by just looking at it, and I didn't want to waste more time than needed. So I was contemplating what version of the game I was going to play, you know, for the basis of this review. And I, you know, after thinking about it, I decided, you know what, I'm just going to stick with the OG PS1 release in 1998 because I already have the PS3 hooked up because of my Resident Evil 1 video. Let's just make it a little easier for myself. Though, if you do have the spare cache, I, I recommend you hunt down a copy for the Nintendo GameCube. It has a higher resolution, uh, slightly smoother graphics, and it allows you to skip in-game cutscenes so that you can just, you know, get a move on when you're practicing all those A-rank playthroughs. But here we are, the original Resident Evil 2, and boy does this have some history behind it. About a month after the completion of the first game, just a month, Capcom went right to work on the sequel and started showing conceptual designs as early as their V-Jump presentation in 1996. The viral outbreak that plagued the Arcalay Mansion has somehow found its way into the heart of the nearby Raccoon City, infecting hundreds of thousands of civilians. Our protagonists this time were Leon S. Kennedy, veteran officer of the Raccoon City Police Department, and Elza Walker, college student on vacation with the world's shittiest timing and luck. Together with their respective allies, these two would find a means to escape the zombie-infested metropolitan area, taking them through the RPD station, the sewers below, and the secret laboratory close by. Shinji Mikami returned to the series as producer this time, with reigning Twitter block champion Hideki Kamiya on board as the director. And though the two apparently butted heads on creative differences at points, development on the sequel was progressing nevertheless. But then, I'm guessing around early 1997, the development team felt what they were working on just wasn't hitting the right notes. Mikami would later describe the product as feeling dull and boring, and fearing that the product wouldn't meet quality standards by the projected May of 1997 release date, the team decided to start from scratch. To a point, several assets would carry over to the second attempt as the team felt there were a lot of things that worked individually, but not as a whole. Coming to that decision must have sucked big time. I'm pretty sure we've all been there in some regard. You're working on something, you see some pieces coming together, but you're just not jiving with the whole thing. And for a whole team to feel like that over a game that was like already 40 to 60% completed, Damn, that had to have been a tremendously bitter pill to swallow. You know what though, why not? Let's spend a little time on the Resident Evil that never was. An early build of the game would leak in 2013, and thanks to some dedicated fans, it's very possible to play this on an emulator. And I want to thank my buddy Tom for helping me get the assets needed to experience it. Just a warning though, it's very rough around the edges and you'll likely need to use the debug tool to get around. No loading doors, first thing I noticed. Not sure if they were dropped altogether or maybe like one of the last things implemented into the game. You can't interact with most objects and there are some doors that weren't properly programmed yet so rooms don't connect all the time. The layering for the pre-rendered backgrounds are largely unfinished making progression a little confusing too and the collision detection for stairs can break on a whim. I'm walking on the stairs in the police station and suddenly I find myself phasing out of existence and essentially soft lock in the game. Look at that goofy ass stair animation anyway, I'm walking on these like that Japanese robot from Honda. You can choose between Leon or Elza at the start. In the context of this game, Leon isn't a rookie cop. He's got a couple of years under his belt this time. He's also a little more pessimistic. You meet up with your partner Marvin early on, who originally had a much larger role in this game than he would end up getting in the final version. And he insists Leon help him locate survivors, but Leon's all like, why? The place is all gone to shit. Pretty jarring compared to the lovable dork he ends up being later on. And believe it or not, the chief of police, Brian Irons, was also supposed to be a good guy in this version. Could you even imagine what that would have been like? I can't fathom the idea given how much of a psychopath he is in the completed release. Weird to see Ada Wong is nothing more than a scientist working for Umbrella in this build. Maybe she was still an undercover agent for the agency this early on? It's hard to tell, there's barely any story here, and there's no research files to pick up to get some sort of clarification. Elsa gets this dude named John as an ally who will later be reworked as Robert Kendo 
owner of the gun shop that gets massacred just a couple of minutes into the final game. That said, there isn't much to know about Elza. College student, likes to ride bikes, has blonde hair in one design, then has brown hair in the next. For all intents and purposes, she's just a prototype of Claire Redfield. And while I do like Claire as a character, I don't know, there's a part of me that hopes Elza gets brought into the main continuity in some fashion. There isn't much to her besides some conceptual designs I'm aware, but given enough dedication, I can see her being a fun character in some other game. Seems like such a waste to completely scrap besides a costume reference in the remake. And while I can see what they meant about the game feeling dull, I mean, I know the game isn't technically finished at this point, but the early version of the police station felt amazingly cold and sterile. I recognize a few layouts that will carry over to the final product, but I had the bitchiest time exploring this place. The broken layering and collision were one thing, but certain pre-rendered camera angles worked too well in obscuring other pathways. It was by complete accident that I stumbled upon certain hallways to proceed. The whole place felt like such a boring drive. I know it's supposed to be a scary game in the middle of a zombie epidemic, but areas were so forgettable, I couldn't remember where I've been and haven't been for both Leon and Elsa. The revamped station in the final version is an improvement in almost every sense. There's still some interesting nuggets here nevertheless. Unused enemies, I always love seeing this kind of stuff. We got uh, undead baboons, gorillas, the heads throw me off. Either way, they fucking hurt. They're like hunters, only infinitely more pissed off. There are also these human spider hybrids in the lab. They're a little too close to the chimera design wise, so I can see why these were likely scrapped in favor of the more iconic liquors. William Birkin's first G form also looks a tad different here, almost in a Frankenstein's creature sense. And he even mummers the word Sherry during the encounter. Sherry. The last remnants of his humanity before the transformation completely took him. Kinda sad, until you remember the whole trying to impregnate his young daughter with a G embryo thing. Ugh. A few areas in this version will end up being used in the 2019 remake, like the firing range. That was pretty cool to discover. I think there was supposed to be a puzzle here, but the only thing you can do is interact with the targets. You push the switch again, and you can force the thing off its pathway and push your character towards the wall. Apparently, there was even supposed to be an actual bathroom. The door to it is locked? Yeah, but that's better than no bathroom at all. Seriously, where do these cops shit? The sewer area was also much bigger originally, which again will later be implemented in the remake. So fascinating learning about that sort of thing. Zombies are damn aggressive here on top of being faster overall. Female zombies will still hunt you down even if you blow their heads off, though you just harmlessly push them off if they manage to grab you. I thought that was pretty funny. To get more zombies on screen at once, the development team intentionally lowered the polygon counts of the model, so individually they look pretty bad, but in a pack it's quite a sight to behold and one thing I'm glad they eased up on later. Cause I can see the game being so much harder if every zombie was this aggressive in the final product, especially this one in the jail cell. Now he's, he's really helping the shit out of that wall. So the game would not only bring back typewriters for saving progress, but you could also use computers to do the same thing. Probably just as an alternate means, but instead of using ink ribbons, you use memory cards. Very meta. There's several items hidden behind the coating. A lot of them don't work or just straight up crash the game. But I was surprised to see this build have working grenades. They're next to impossible to use correctly because they phase through walls and shit. But that's interesting to find. I think proper grenades wouldn't be officially implemented until Resident Evil Remake, if I'm remembering that correctly. But to see that they were an idea considered as early as this game is awesome. Also, there's just straight up a Pepsi machine here and I spend about a minute processing this. It's so out of nowhere because there's still the other generic cola machine in the second floor of this place, but then here's just Pepsi. I don't know if Capcom early on struck a deal with the company for some product placement. I couldn't find anything during research, but here it is. Resident Evil 1.5, as fans call it nowadays, is very much a broken, unfinished mess, and I can clearly see why the team were unhappy with the product. But there's still much to savor in its historical value, so I implore you to check it out yourself if you're a Resident Evil buff. Folks are still tinkering with it to this day, trying to connect the dots so it's a, a little more stable for one thing, all while keeping true to the original design, and maybe with a little more time, we might get some more insight on what was or what could have been. Hashtag justice for Elza Walker. Canceling this iteration of the sequel was a major setback for Capcom. To make amends, they would release a director's cut of the original Resident Evil to tie fans over as the development of the second game essentially restarted. But despite their hurdles, Capcom was hell bent on getting people excited. Late 1997 to early 1998 was all about Resident Evil 2. Over $5 million was spent on the advertising campaign. Magazines, demo samplers, commercials, including one directed by Mr. Night of the Living Dead himself, George A. Romero, whose work was a major inspiration for the Resident Evil series as a whole. Kind of coming full circle there. The final version of Resident Evil 2 would see release in early 1998 to much deserved acclaim. It would end up being one of the highest selling games on the PlayStation and is in fact the best selling Resident Evil on an individual console, with over 5.5 million units sold. This game was everywhere in my neck of the woods during release. My friends in middle school would not shut up about it. I would first see the game in action watching a friend play at his house and the only question I asked him was, so, uh, can you unlock Akuma like the magazine said? Unfortunately he said no, I felt betrayed, fuck this game back. 
back to Final Fantasy VII. So right after playing Resident Evil 1 and the remake, I went like, straight into Resident Evil 2. Having prior knowledge of the game, uh, whether it was from magazines or just word of mouth, left me eager to see what I was missing out on. A couple of months have passed since the incident in the Arkale Mansion. Surviving Stars members Chris, Jill, Barry, and Rebecca attempted to warn the Raccoon City Police Department that the major pharmaceutical company Umbrella was the one behind the viral outbreak. But alas, their proclamations sort of fall on deaf ears since the Chief of Police Brian Irons is secretly taking bribes from the company, and because the mansion self-destructed, they sort of don't have any damning evidence, so that sucks. Stars is later disbanded, but that's more of a tale for another time. For our protagonists in this game are Leon S. Kennedy, rookie cop of the Raccoon City Police Department getting ready for his first day on the job, Jesus Christ, and Claire Redfield, the younger sister of Chris who's trying to locate the whereabouts of her missing brother. The two find themselves entering Raccoon City around the same time, and fuck what a time it is for the entire city has been infected with another viral outbreak, turning most of its civilians into the walking dead. After some close encounters with the undead kind, the two eventually team up inside the Raccoon City Police Department to look for survivors and to find a means to safely evacuate the city altogether. And though I realize I just said team up, they actually spend a majority of the game split up because there's no such thing as safety in numbers in the realm of Resident Evil. But both characters aren't completely alone. Claire eventually finds company with Sherry Birkin, young daughter of Annette and William Birkin, two scientists who ain't winning Parent of the Year trophies anytime soon, I can tell you now. Claire also meets with Brian Irons, the chief of police, but it doesn't take very long to figure out that that man is batshit insane and gets everything coming to him soon after. Leon eventually teams up with a mysterious Ada Wong, who claims to be looking for her boyfriend, John. I mean, do we tell her he's been written out of this version of the game? I don't know. But it's all a front anyway, since she's actually a secret agent for an unknown company trying to obtain a sample of the G-Virus a new weapon developed by William Birkin who planned to make a name for himself with his research, but ends up nearly assassinated by Umbrella operatives who knew that Birkin was planning to turn against them. Unfortunately for Umbrella, and for everyone inside the city, Birkin gets the idea to inject himself with his own creation to save his life, slowly causing him to mutate into this scientific abomination, with a penchant for yelling. It's in fact thanks to Birkin's transformation that the city became infected in the first place, for soon after he breaks free from the lab, nearby sewer rats would ingest some of the virus from the broken vials and eventually cause the epidemic, though I do find it a bit strange that we never fight infected rats in this game. Leon and Claire's journey takes them through the dilapidated police station, the sewers beneath the station, and eventually a hidden research laboratory not too far off from the city, all while discovering diaries and research files that reveal things like a secret conspiracy between the chief of police and the Umbrella Corporation, as well as learning the unfortunate fates of the rest of the police department and other civilians who simply learned too much or were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They really know how to sell the hopelessness of the situation this time, it makes the villain seem even more douchey. And to make matters worse, every area is riddled with both the undead and bioorganic weapons, courtesy of Umbrella. Zombies, those damn Cerberus dogs, giant spiders, who are considerably downplayed here than in the first game now that I think about it. Uh, there's mutated plants, and perhaps the most iconic enemy of them all? Liquors. Exposed brains, long tongues, can't see worth a damn. The story hits a lot of similar beats as the original, at least given how things progress. The police station, for instance, was converted from an old art museum, so several set pieces wouldn't be out of place from the mansion in the first game. There's a corrupt official, last game was Wesker, this game it's Brian Irons, so if you ask me, Brian Irons is a way more despicable human being. The final area of the game is the science lab, there's a self-destruct sequence, there's a moment where you blow up a monster with a rocket launcher. There seems to be a formula now, how long will it last remains to be seen, and we have a lot of games left to cover. It's a clearly more cinematic direction, you could thank Hideki Kamiya for that. We're not in Devil May Cry territory yet, but the action is ramping up. The live action FMVs are gone, but in its place we have a CGI opening that's full of gunfire, crashing vehicles, explosions. There's just more cutscenes, period, both in game and CGI, and I welcome it. With more time spent on Leon and Claire, we get more of an idea of who these two are than we could do with Jill and Chris. Which helps make them more relatable, you know, it's not just you know, two characters reacting to shit happening around them and nothing but. They ask questions and they get answers. Time is spent on elaborating details, from files we find across the game to learning about other ill-fated characters leading to some startling discoveries. It helps build up mysteries with some satisfying payoffs. The in-game presentation, while still a little stiff, is miles better than the original game. Models are better animated, and it feels like there was actual direction this time in the voice acting. Though, sometimes they can still miss the mark. We've got to go now, honey, okay? If we stay here, that monster will find us. Let's go. No, I won't. What's the matter? <laughs> Don't you trust me? Jesus Christ, you can sound a little less ominous there, Claire. What's the matter? <laughs> Don't you trust me? It's still a pretty straightforward narrative overall, because among all the terrors and bric-a-brac, the most important thing that matters are the two characters finding a means to escape the city. It isn't Leon or Claire's intention to learn more about this conspiracy, they just happen to be in the middle of it. We learn shit as they do. By the end of the game, Leon vows to put an end to Umbrella, as I'd imagine we want to as well after seeing the shit they caused, and Claire is hell-bent on finding Chris now that she knows how bad things have gotten. 
A story that's a good blend of suspense, action, and terror, one of my favorites of the series with a soundtrack that is Aces. Man, I love this soundtrack. It does an amazing job selling the desperation of the situation, the emotional beats, the momentary respites, all while paying respects to the cheesy age of horror the series draws inspiration from with a large amount of piano and synth. If you want a go-to example, the save room theme, bar none, to me a perfect summary of everything Resident Evil 2 is about. So in this game, we got Leon and Claire's playable characters. We've got a bit of a role reversal since it's Leon this time who's the easier character to play as, since he gets a lot more love in the weapon department. Claire gets her share of toys, make no mistake. She gets the grenade launcher much like Jill did before, and he can still outfit with grenade rounds, fire rounds, and ridiculously powerful acid rounds. And he can even switch out ammo types whenever you want this time instead of having to spend all the ammo inside the gun like before. She also gets this bow gun, and I don't like it much at all. It's hard to hit stuff with it, even with the auto aim on, there's very little ammo for it throughout the game. I usually ignore this and just give her the submachine gun you can find in the weapon storage room late in the police station section. Leon though, his default gun holds more bullets, he gets a shotgun, he gets a magnum, there's ammo all all over the place for these if you know how to check every nook and cranny, and with the use of small keys he can unlock drawers that have custom parts that can upgrade his guns to wreck some more shit. He can make his default gun have burst action, you can make his magnum absurdly powerful making bosses a little more than small roadblocks, oh, but nothing beats the custom shotgun. Sometimes if you really want to sell me a weapon all you need is good sound design, and one shot from this… Oh, oh, I love this gun. Leon is easily my preferred character in this game, I just love his selection of weapons, but even though I think he's easier to jump into than Claire, Resident Evil 2 is undoubtedly easier than the first game as a whole. Firstly, both characters rock the same number of inventory spaces this time, 8 slots, the same amount that Jill had before, so item management is less of a hassle by default, and the design of the area ensures that there's always an item box relatively close by so that you can make a quick trip for an item you might need later. A quick nitpick though, I think this game could have been a little better with certain items. There's a couple of times where the game requires you use a tool you picked up like an hour ago, or one you haven't used in a while. The need for the valve in the sewer, the crank in the clock room, like I said there's usually an item box nearby anyway, but I did find these to be the two sour points of progression. Puzzles have lesser presence here altogether. You push a couple of things for some easy solutions, this power generator takes little to no time to solve, and in the case of the library puzzle, the picture to the right tells you the exact answer, so just replicate it. Definitely dumbed down compared to last time, and this might be a detriment depending on what you look for in Resident Evil, but I don't mind the smaller emphasis. If it keeps things moving, that's what I care about. There's plenty more ammo to collect as long as you got a knack for exploration. The opening of the game places you deep in the infected streets of the city where zombies fill every waking corner, and while it's certainly possible to maneuver around them, the game gives you a comfortable amount of ammo drops throughout to help you get to the police station, and I feel this sort of design permeates through the whole game. And sometimes, I think they want you to spill some guts, because some areas, the police station definitely, has a few hallways that are positively riddled with zombies and it's next to impossible to run past them without some insane precision. They want you to use that grenade launcher, they want you to use that shotgun, and I don't think it was just a means to drain resources for added tension. No, considering how much ammo is available this time, I think it's purely for cathartic reasoning. So go for it. People say Resident Evil 4 is when the series started to emphasize action, shit no, that started as early as this game. But despite giving you more ammo, boss fights are still a weak point. They're better than the first game, but that isn't saying much in my opinion. Most of them are still the usual, run a few steps back, aim your gun, fire a couple shots, lather, rinse, repeat. Not very fun, and the pre-render camera angles are at their most intrusive here. It can be so annoying, you want to get some distance to line up a safe shot, but then the angle suddenly changes and I'm thrown off. Make sure you have the auto aim turned on, it can save you a lot of frustration. I should note the game still encourages you to pick your battles carefully, especially when you got two or three bioweapons hugging you in a tiny ass room. You can lose health very quickly if you're not careful, and in this game you do not want to take too much damage. Instead of having to rely on checking your inventory to see where your health is, Leon and Clay will not give you a visual indication of when their health is starting to wane. They put their hands on their waist, their running looks a little weaker, I mean, you can still check the pause screen to see your exact health if you want, and trust me, you don't want to get into danger territory because body movement slows to an agonizing limp which is a fucking death sentence. It is the one thing I actively hate about this game. I think it should be punishment enough that I let my health get this bad and that the next swipe or bite is my death, but don't make it more difficult to get away. I understand that this was a way to rack the nerves, but this was a bit overkill. Also got a question the hit detection and damage values in this game. There was a joke we made during the let's play we did years back on SGB, that Leon's alternate costume gave him magical pants that let him eat Birkin's barrage of attacks and still be perfectly fine. Oh. God damn! Warned 
You still want it? <laughs> it's, it's the pants. It's the pants. <laughs> it's the pants. <laughs> but don't look down on Leon's default uniform yet because check this shit out. I took a lot of damage from these liquors. I got no health items. I'm in danger. I'm limping. I'm an hour and a half in. I didn't save my game. Death is goddamn certain. And the liquors somehow miss every attack after this. What the flying shit? I should be dead. Who knew in dire straits Leon could phase through shit like fucking Shadow Cat? Resident Evil 2 was originally a two disc game, one disc for Leon and the other for Claire. It was likely because of the FMVs. There's a decent chunk of them with most being duplicates, just changing to reflect their current character's perspective. But the game decides to have a little more fun with this choice of medium. Unlike before, the adventure is not as generic as picking a character and going through their side of the story. Whoever you pick first will be that character's A scenario, and when you complete it, the next character can go through their B scenario. Certain things you do in the A scenario can affect the B scenario of the other character. Uh, for example, there's a point where you can close these shutters here, blocking zombies from slumping into the hallway in the first or second floor, but if you do that, the shutters will eventually short out, leaving the second character to deal with a sudden surge of enemies in their second scenario. In the lab, you can use this computer to activate this anti-BOW gas that makes everything inside easier to kill, but the game explicitly mentions that if you use it, the enemies will eventually grow immune to it and get stronger as a result. Basically, if A scenario uses it, B scenario will have a harder time when they get to the lab. Save it for B scenario, just gonna say that now. But these are just a couple of things that can affect how you approach the second character's playthrough. I love it. To me, it's a great spin on the standard adventure, adding a good deal of replayability and a layer of strategy to the mix. Personally, I tend to save all the safety nets for the B scenario, since there are a couple of things that inherently make the B scenario more difficult, like Mr. X here. The next an Umbrella's Tyrant assembly line with a dapper coat and a mean swing. He'll pop in during a few points of the character's B scenario, and I don't quite get that since you would think this hulking beast would be an obstacle for both characters in either scenario. And this is something I'm glad the remake addresses despite being way more terrifying gun. I can't imagine what Nemesis is gonna be like, I'll say that for later. Depending on where you encounter him, you might need to pump him full of lead to temporarily put him down and get safe passage. If you got the spare ammo, I'd say it's very much worth incapacitating him because you can get some rare ammo drops for both Leon and Claire. Leon especially. Shotgun shells and magnum rounds? Yes please. He's durable, but he isn't very nimble and I think he's easy enough to maneuver around. Either way, another great way of giving a character's B scenario more identity besides the character you're using. The story can also sort of change depending on who you pick first. Relatively minor stuff overall, but you can get additional details depending on the character you're using. And certain characters also sort of get painted in a different light, with some meeting slightly different fates, like Brian Irons and Ben the Reporter. They either get clobbered to death or get torn apart from the inside thanks to Birkin's G embryo. In cases like Annette Birkin, Sherry's mother, you might consider her too caught up in her work and hell-bent on avenging her husband if you play one scenario. But if you go ahead and play the other, you'll see that she's also emotionally distraught that she couldn't be a better mother to Sherry, adding a bit more depth to her. No matter if you choose Leon A or Claire B or Claire A and Leon B, the latter fans deem the most canonical, there's nuances and details to add to the narrative as a whole from all of these scenarios, giving you more reason to go back and see what else you can find if you played the game this way or that way. I love this game. I regret not getting to it when it came out. It's still one of my favorites in the series and easily my favorite in the classic lineup. The graphics have aged, the tank controls are still a thing, there are mechanics that feel outright antiquated like the save system you can only use it so many times. I understand the appeal of this game can be limited, but hey, I didn't start playing these games until Resident Evil 4, and I went back and managed to enjoy myself, and I consider myself a fucking simpleton. If I can do it, I think you can do it as well, and you should. It helps that it isn't a terribly long game, no matter who you pick or the scenario. Should take you around four to six hours your first go around. There's also a couple of extra things to do after you finish the game as well, though I wouldn't call these uh, console sellers. Assuming you're not playing the N64 version, you got EX Battle Mode where you, um, you're you essentially playing the game backwards. Since you start at the lab and you have to make your way all the way back to the police station to deactivate some bombs using nothing but the items at your disposal and the limited supply across the pathway. You start with Leon and Claire, but with enough playtime you can also play as Ada Wong and even Chris Redfield. Just don't tell Claire her brother was here the whole time, she will fucking flip. If you manage to get an A rank on a normal playthrough, you can also play the fourth survivor, introducing us to the walking enigma that is Hunk, the only Umbrella operative that survived Birkin's massacre. He's like this universe's Boba Fett, people love him so much, only without the lame ass death. You gotta make your way to the extraction point and you're only allowed to use the items on your person, there are no other items to pick up. It's short, but damn is it tough, and if it wasn't hard enough for you, you can also unlock a second version of this where you play as a block of tofu who can only use knives. This is bizarre, but memorable. I never unlocked it for myself since you need to complete six scenarios on one memory card, scoring an A rank in one of them as well. I love this game, but that's exhausting. But in this year of 2020, we have the spectacular remake on the PS4, and really, if you have to play one version of Resident Evil 2, make it that one. I'll leave a link to my original review on the card up top, it's still one of my favorite games of 2019, and a lot of what I said then still holds up now. It's so damn good. 
And since that video, the game has gotten some additional DLC, like the Ghost Survivors, and man, do I not give a flying shit about these. They're all basically the same challenges for Survivor, where you have to scramble to the goal using a limited number of items, only instead of playing as Hunk, you're playing as other characters in these what-if scenarios. What if the mayor's daughter survived her assault from Brian Irons? What if Robert Kendo didn't kill himself after seeing his young kid become a zombie? What if there was another Umbrella operative that survived Birkin's attack? That last one I say, I mean, wasn't that the entire point of Hunk? That just seems redundant. Also, Robert Kendo killing himself in the original story was a pretty downer moment to increase the feeling of hopelessness in the remake's overall darker narrative. I know it was mainly implied, but to me, if you make a what if where he didn't kill himself, you're basically confirming that he did pull the trigger in the actual story, and I don't know, it sort of leaves a bad taste in my mouth. It's a minor thing, but something I couldn't help but think about. Really, there isn't much to these, they're just more of the same type of challenge that the Force Survivor offered. But compared to that, considering how much shit they throw at you at once with new types of enemies like these pale heads or exploding poison zombies and all that, it, it feels like it's way more emphasis on trial and error than Force Survivor. You're playing these over and over again until you memorize where's what, what kind of items do you need at this time, basically you're trying to get a perfect run. It can work, shit, it works for Dark Souls, but Resident Evil isn't... Dark Souls? It's all harmless either way, I realize. It doesn't cost a thing to download, so it can only add to your playtime if you're looking to get more out of it. I think the main campaigns are more than enough if you ask me, and if you still haven't considered getting this, well, we're about a year since my initial video, and now you can get this game for less than 30 bucks, and that's a fucking steal. Get this game. It's good. Good is great. Great is good. I know what I said. But now we're at a point where I'm beginning to feel a little uh, uneasy because the next game in the lineup, Resident Evil 3, I haven't touched this my first playthrough all the way back in 2005 and I remember not liking a few things about it, but that was over 15 years ago, things could very much change, so here's hoping. I'll see you guys next time with Resident Evil 3 Nemesis. Thank you all for watching, have yourselves a fantastic night, and take care.